there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, all the day's major developing stories here on Prime. A massive fire at a chemical plant near Houston is prompting evacuations, shelter in place orders, and concerns about contamination and illness. We're in Texas for more on the developing story. Plus, the top contenders for the Republican presidential nomination descend on Miami as Donald Trump holds a competing rally just mere miles away, while his own daughter testifies in court as the legal woes against him pile up. And. Fate, fight, forget, forgive, and my family. Why did you name them? Because I have to carry them the remaining days of my life. It's the Supreme Court case that could put more firearms in the hands of domestic abusers. A Louisiana mother and survivor shares her harrowing experience, including the bullets she still carries. Everyone, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including the U.S. strike against an Iran-linked facility and what the Secretary of Defense is calling an act of self-defense, plus why President Biden's son and brother could be hauled before Congress to answer questions. And Ohio just became the 24th state to legalize marijuana. How close the vote came and the hundreds of millions the state will rake in when we take a look by the numbers. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we do begin with former President Trump's daughter, Ivanka, taking the stand in a $250 million civil trial focused on her father and the family business. Ivanka's testimony was the last for the prosecution and very different than that of her father and brother. She had fought for weeks to try and not give testimony and ultimately was forced to. Late this afternoon, New York Attorney General Letitia James rested her case against Donald Trump and his adult sons. All of this comes on the same night the five leading candidates, not including former President Trump, are taking to the debate stage in Miami. We're following it all tonight and begin with our senior investigative reporter, Aaron Kurtersky, who's tracked this trial from the beginning. She's not a defendant in this case, and she didn't want to be here. But today, Ivanka Trump forced to testify in the civil fraud trial threatening the Trump family business. How are you feeling, Ivanka? On the witness stand, she testified she played no role in her father's statements of financial condition that the judge has determined were riddled with fraud. Those weren't things I was privy to, she said, echoing her deposition. I, I don't specifically know what was prepared on his behalf for him as a person separate and distinct from the organization. She acknowledged working to secure loans guaranteed by her father's wealth for Trump properties like the Doral Golf Club in Miami. But she says she couldn't remember the details, at one point saying, I believe it was the ninth month of pregnancy of my oldest daughter. Attorney General Letitia James unmoved. This case is about fraudulent statements of financial condition that she benefited from. She was enriched, and clearly you cannot distance yourself from that fact. Some really definitive statements there from the Attorney General. Aaron joins us now from the courthouse in Manhattan. And Aaron, we know Ivanka Trump was the last uh, state witness. What comes next? So the state has now rested its case, Lindsay, and the defense is going to start calling witnesses on Monday. It's going to be an uphill climb for the defense since the judge has already ruled that former President Trump engaged in fraud. The attorney general's office may try to make it even more difficult for the defense. Tomorrow, they'll try to disqualify some of the defense expert witnesses. Lindsay? Aaron Katursky for us. Aaron, our thanks to you. For more on Ivanka Trump's testimony in the prosecution's case as they finish with their last witness, we're joined by former federal prosecutor and ABC News contributor Khan Nowaday. Khan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as you know, the prosecution presented what they say is evidence that proves Ivanka was enriched and benefited from this fraud. What was that evidence and how significant is it? Is it? Well, that evidence is significant only to the extent that it may uh, allow the AG's office to seek a remedy from uh, Ms. Trump, meaning she's not in the case. She's not a defendant. She's not liable, right, as a defendant. However, there is a means through the law where even if you're not a defendant in the case, if the government can show some unjust enrichment, they can ask the judge to say, hey, 
that money should come back to us. It was reminding me of Oliver North when she took the stand today. She kept saying she, she couldn't recall, she didn't remember the discussions, she didn't remember the documents. How, how effective of a defense is that? Uh, it's only effective to the extent that she doesn't overdo it. Uh, I'm not saying that she was, uh, actually did remember, but you know, you can't do it so much where it kind of strains common sense. If there are things she should have remembered, then it, it kind of leads to uh, undercut her credibility. So the prosecution rested its case today. We're now gonna hear from the defense uh, next week. What can we expect from Trump's defense team? Well, they've put in a witness list of over 100 witnesses. We're not gonna see that. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if you see a couple witnesses. They put in some documents. I think it's a cat and mouse game that the defense is playing with the AG's office by saying we're gonna call all these witnesses. That's not gonna happen. I think it's gonna be a very short defense case and then it's gonna be in the judge's hands. Why have the 100 witness list just to make the prosecution do its due diligence on all those witnesses? Yes, it's just strategy because then it's harder for the prosecution to prepare. But I can't see the defense calling that many witnesses. I think they're just gonna call a few, put in some documents and rest. Con nowadays, always appreciate your insight. Thanks so much. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill today, House Republicans ramped up their impeachment inquiry into President Biden, issuing new subpoenas to members of President Biden's family. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas joins us now. And Pierre, who are these subpoenas targeting and, and how's the White House and Biden family responding tonight? Well, as the House Oversight Committee has issued subpoenas for testimony of members of President Biden's family, including his brother James and his son Hunter. The committee escalating its efforts to see if President Biden financially benefited from family business deals, which House Republicans are claiming amounted to influence peddling. But so far, Chairman James Comer's committee has produced no evidence of crimes by the president. And today, the White House dismissed the impeachment inquiry as a baseless smear campaign that has turned up zero evidence. Hunter Biden's attorney responded to the subpoena, saying his client would eagerly testify in public at the right time, even as he called the committee's efforts a political stunt, Lindsay. All right, Pierre Thomas for us from Washington. Thanks so much, Pierre. We turn now to the latest developments in the Middle East with news of U.S. airstrikes on a weapons storage facility in Syria. The Pentagon says the retaliatory strikes come after Iranian-backed forces have been targeting American troops in both Iraq and Syria for weeks since the conflict in Israel began. We have team coverage on the latest developments tonight, including ABC's Matt Rivers in Israel. But we go first to our chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raddatz, in Washington. Tonight, retaliation. U.S. warplanes striking a weapons facility in Syria after Iranian-backed forces targeted American troops in Iraq and Syria with a barrage of drone and rocket attacks over the weekend, making at least 40 such attacks on Americans since mid-October. Most of those intercepted and no serious injuries reported. This is the second time the U.S. has launched these retaliatory airstrikes in response to attacks on American troops by Iran-backed militants. On October 26th, launching missiles into two weapons storage facilities in Syria. Just hours before these latest retaliatory attacks, one of the most serious provocations by Iranian-backed militants since the Israel-Hamas conflict began. A U.S. defense official confirming that Houthi forces in Yemen shot down a U.S. Reaper drone over waters off Yemen's coast. The MQ-9 Reaper is one of the most sophisticated and expensive armed drones in the U.S. arsenal. Just weeks ago, the USS Kearney brought down four Houthi cruise missiles and more than a dozen drones aimed towards Israel from the Red Sea. Martha Raddatz joins us now. And Martha, just underscore for us the significance of these strikes at this moment in the Middle East. Lindsay, tonight's retaliatory strikes coming at a time of extremely high tensions in the region. And while the U.S. is trying to make sure the war in Israel does not spread, Defense Secretary Austin saying in a statement, the United States is fully prepared to take further necessary measures to protect our people and our facilities. Lindsay? Martha Raddatz for us. Thanks so much, Martha. As the war between Israel and Hamas now enters its second month, there are multiple reports that tense negotiations are now underway for the release of up to 15 hostages, including Americans. ABC's Matt Rivers is in Israel with more. Tonight, urgent negotiations underway for the potential release of dozens of hostages held by Hamas in Gaza. 
Sources telling ABC News Israel is considering a proposal brought by Egypt and Qatar for a humanitarian pause in exchange for the release with the U.S. in close coordination. But so far, no final deal has been reached. Just days ago, David Pressing, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on the hostages, which includes Americans. Netanyahu saying no ceasefire unless the hostages are released. If Hamas agrees to release the hostages, then there would be a pause. Well, there'd be a ceasefire for that purpose. Uh, and we're waiting for that to happen. It hasn't happened so far. Do you know where the hostages are? Do you know where the Americans are? We have some uh, intelligence. I'm not sure it's wise to uh, share it here with Hamas. The Israeli military saying ground forces are pushing deeper into Gaza City, destroying 130 tunnel shafts, claiming Hamas has lost control of northern Gaza. The UN saying 40,000 Palestinians fled south over the past three days through a humanitarian corridor set up by the IDF, some in this crowd holding white flags. And the civilian death toll keeps rising. Ten-year-old Hanin saying she's scared of the bombings and just wants to go back home and back to school. Such dire descriptions there. Matt Rivers joins us now from Tel Aviv. And, and Matt, we've been talking about these negotiations for a hostage release for days now. What indications are you hearing that they might be getting closer to a deal? Yeah, Lindsay, we know that the United States, Israel, Qatar, all parties involved really pushing hard to finalize a deal. Everyone seems to recognize the urgency of the moment here. But what is unclear is how these latest U.S. strikes in the region will complicate those efforts. It's just a reminder, Lindsay, that this entire region is on a knife's edge, as is that hostage deal. Lindsay? Matt Rivers for us from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Matt. Back here in the U.S., a dangerous explosion and fire at a chemical plant near Houston, Texas, prompted evacuations across a five-mile radius today. ABC's John Quinones is on the scene in Shepherd, Texas. Tonight, that massive inferno of flames and fumes northeast of Houston. What a horrific sight to be seen from a thousand feet above the ground. The calls coming in just after eight this morning from Sound Resource Solutions, a chemical plant in Shepherd, Texas. Our Office of Emergency Management has issued that shelter in place for a five mile radius around the plant. At first I thought they were emptying the garbage bin, but then after you heard the third and fourth and fifth explosion that were one after another. Schools have been advised to shelter in place, turn off all HVACs. One school close to the plant forced to evacuate 31 children. We had to evacuate them through a pasture. Uh, a man owns a large piece of property over there, and they were gracious enough to open the gates and allow uh, these vehicles to uh, traverse his land. We are seeing some of these uh, mini explosions happening yet again. Look at this right here. Tammy zooming into it. Boy, this is very concerning. The plant houses multiple kinds of toxic and highly flammable materials. We do oil fill chemicals, we do paint and coatings chemicals, hazardous materials, yes, but it's the type of material you probably have under your kitchen sink. It's not to be taken lightly. Wow, something so common. John Quinones joins us. Now, John, any word on what caused this? Well, all they're telling us, Lindsay, is that it was the result of a forklift incident. The uh, driver of that forklift sustained minor burns and was taken to a local hospital. Meanwhile, officials here continue to monitor air quality. Lindsay? So important. All right, John, our thanks to you. To Miami tonight, where five Republican candidates for president are squaring off on the debate stage. This comes after last night's elections with big wins for Democrats, especially on abortion. And of course, the elephant in the room, once again, the front runner, former President Trump, will not be there. ABC's senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott reports in from Miami. Tonight, Democrats pointing to victories in Virginia, Kentucky, and Ohio as proof abortion is increasingly the issue that decides elections. The voters said, look, the government should not be telling a woman what to do with her body. President Biden declaring democracy won and MAGA lost. And in an attempt to dismiss his own sliding poll numbers, he added, voters vote, polls don't. In Ohio, voters overwhelmingly choosing to protect abortion rights in the state constitution. In Virginia, voters rejected the Republican governor's effort to flip the state legislature from Democratic control. He promised to sign a 15-week abortion ban with exceptions, casting it as a compromise. Voters rejected that. 
Uh, I'm a little disappointed, to be clear. And in the South, a rare red state Democratic governor winning re-election, fending off his opponent's effort to tie him to President Biden. It was a victory that sends a loud, clear message. A message that candidates should run for something and not against someone. <laughs> that a candidate should show vision and not sow division. Rachel Scott joins us now from Miami. Rachel, what are the candidates saying about this disappointing results for Republicans last night? Well, the DeSantis team is making it very clear tonight that this is the moment they say that Republicans have to be tired of losing, that they can't continue on this streak, and that they have to start sending the right message to Republican voters across the country. But of course, this is a Republican field that is still deeply divided, specifically on the issue of abortion. You have Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. He's on his home turf tonight. He does support a nationwide 15-week abortion ban. Compare that to former uh, South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, who says that that's unrealistic, Lindsay. Rachel Scott for us from Miami. Thanks so much, Rachel. For more on the fallout from last night's elections, we're joined now by ABC News political director Rick Klein. Rick, of course, we saw major victories in Ohio, Kentucky, Virginia last night. Abortion was a key motivating factor in all of them. Do you feel like Democrats should feel pretty good that they're going to be able to carry this momentum into 2024? Yeah, look, each one of those states, you saw Republicans attacking it from a slightly different angle. In Ohio, they didn't even want to bring this to an initiative at all. They were trying to block it. In Virginia, Glenn Youngkin was very, uh, very straightforward about what he wanted to do. And in Kentucky, you, you had the, the Republican candidate kind of playing defense the whole time. In, in no, no matter what the strategy was, though, it didn't work for Republicans. And, and Democrats and, uh, and organizers on the left were able to say, look, this is about restricting a right, and this is about an attempt by Republicans to take away something that you previously had as a right. And we saw the turnout. We saw the remaking of the electorate in, in Ohio, in Virginia, and in Kentucky, a very red state, to, to have this rebuke to conservatives and to reelect a Democratic governor in the wake of the Donald Dobbs ruling is striking and it continues a pattern that, yes, Democrats very much want to see continue over the next year. So want to talk about Virginia in particular and the governor there yeah. who was not even on the ballot but really made himself relevant with regard to how he campaigned for abortion. And in the end, there was a little bit of a, a referendum on that. Yeah, and it became nationalized, too, because Glenn Youngkin was talked about as a potential presidential contender. And this was his own midterm. He was very clear. If the Republicans win control of the legislature, we're going to have a 15-week abortion ban with exceptions for rape, for incest, for life of the mother. He said this is a middle ground. Look, that's not a six-week ban. It's not a total ban. It's it's a compromise. And he said that he was going to bring it to voters, and he's pretty confident that his popularity would bring it over the finish line. And give him credit for being straightforward, being honest about what he wanted to do, and give Virginia voters credit for rejecting it, because that's exactly what happened. Uh, he put it out there, and Democrats ended up in control of the legislature now for the rest of Glenn Youngkin's term. And Glenn Youngkin, by the way, said today, I'm not running for president. <laughs> Do you think, not to, no surprise really yeah. there at this point, uh, do you think that the those Republicans who are running for president, who are candidates uh, at this point, will change their approach to abortion as a result of seeing those results? And is there anybody who could actually benefit? Yeah, look, Nikki Haley's been talking about this for a while, and she's liked the idea of something like the Youngkin type of proposal because she says you have to be, uh, you have to find a way to, to win this argument more than just on the legalities, but on the moralities of it and the practicalities of it. And she has tried to to change the language around abortion rights. Uh, Mike Pence, who just dropped out, was more of the absolutist and saying there should be a nationwide ban. We have uh, Governor DeSantis has been talking about trying to get a six-week ban, uh, a total ban, basically, on abortion in Florida. So I'm, I'm curious to see how the candidates handle it from here, knowing that now state after state, red, blue, purple, have all said the same unmistakable message. Uh, when, you, when you give them the opportunity to weigh in on abortion rights, it's in favor of at least some access. Rick, as you know, there's been a lot of hand-wringing among Democrats Democrats with regard to those polls where we've seen yeah. those head-to-head -head matchups, Biden, Trump, and, and Biden really losing. But given the results of last night, do you feel like it's, we're just too soon, too far out to, to really be looking at those polls? There's no question that we are. I also think it's a mistake for Democrats to just ignore the polls entirely. The Biden team has been saying voters win vote, win, win elections, not polls. Well, of course, that makes sense. But, but polls are telling us something unmistakable. And I think what yesterday told us is that it's not that Democrats writ large have a big problem right now. Joe Biden does. And he quite literally is not getting younger. Uh, people are not giving him credit for the economy, for Bidenomics. And he's going to 
back, go into a campaign that is going to be competitive, period, full stop. And I think that realization has to also color Democrats' expectations. Yes, they can win, and maybe they can win with Biden, but it's not going to be an automatic. Rick Klein, appreciate your insight as always. Thanks so much. Good to see you, Lindsay. The House has censured Representative Rashida Tlaib over her rhetoric about Israel. Republicans and 22 Democrats voted to censure the Democrat last night, despite her emotionally defending herself on the House floor. Tlaib is the only Palestinian American in all of Congress. Some members of her own party claim she was promoting false narratives regarding the October 7th Hamas attack. 234 voted yes to censure the Michigan Congresswoman, and 188 voted no. A chilling case in Detroit where police have arrested a suspect wanted for killing a synagogue leader. Samantha Wool was found dead outside of her townhouse last month. Investigators believe she was stabbed inside her home and then stumbled outside and collapsed. Authorities say the suspect acted alone. There is no word of a possible motive yet, and the murder is not being investigated as a hate crime. There was also no sign of forced entry into her home. We turn now to the urgent manhunt 40 miles outside of New York City in Middlesex County, New Jersey, after a suspect wanted in the January 6th attack evaded authorities. Police say Gregory Yetman, seen in this FBI photo, is wanted for the assault of a federal officer. ABC Stephanie Ramos is on the scene. An all-out manhunt tonight in this small central New Jersey town just 40 miles southwest of New York City after this man, wanted in connection to the attack at the Capitol on January 6th, evaded arrest. Gregory Yetman fleeing on foot into the wooded area near his home. Police searching from the sky and on the ground. According to USA Today, Yetman is suspect number 278 AFO, wanted for assault of a federal officer, pictured at the Capitol in these photos on the FBI's website. In an interview earlier this year, Yetman indicated he was at the Capitol that day, but said he did nothing wrong. The FBI leading the multi-agency manhunt in the town of Helmeta. Officers in tactical gear, looking in vehicles, teams moving through backyards, armed with long guns and canines. There were officers running through everybody's yards, um, asking questions. Even though the sun has gone down, we can still see Joint Terrorism Task Force agents going door to door looking for Yetman. According to police, Yetman is in his 40s, last seen wearing a red jacket and baseball cap. He served in the New Jersey National Guard for 12 years and was honorably discharged in March of 2022. They are determined to attain this gentleman today. That is their effort. Lindsay, tonight authorities are urging residents to shelter in place. Streets here in Helmeta were closed for a period of time, and now tactical vehicles and law enforcement officers are lining the street behind me, which is near the house where police believe Yetman was staying. It is still a very active scene here tonight, Lindsay. Stephanie, thank you. Eight people have been killed in a horrific crash on the highway in Batesville, Texas, about 50 miles from the U.S.-Mexico border. A driver allegedly smuggled migrants into the U.S., crashing head-on into an SUV on Highway 57. The driver allegedly tried to outrun police. The highway closed for several hours following the collision. New promise for treating obesity tonight. The FDA has approved a drug from Eli Lilly explicitly for use in treating obesity, ZepBound, as the same active ingredient as diabetes drug Manjaro, and research suggests it could be even more effective for weight loss than Ozempic and Wegovi. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, a powerful new weapon in the fight against obesity. The FDA approving ZepBound with the same ingredient in the diabetes drug Munjaro, but for weight loss. We're changing the way medicine is practiced in the United States by treating the obesity with naturally occurring gut hormone therapy that is going to reverse the risk of developing heart disease and diabetes. Zebbound from Eli Lilly works like the injectable weight loss drugs Ozempic and Wigovi, mimicking a hormone that makes the body feel full. But Zebbound targets a second hormone and research suggests it may lead to more dramatic weight loss. Christy Kaiser says she lost 122 pounds after 15 months on the drug. She says she's no longer pre-diabetic and no longer needs blood pressure medicine. For me personally, it has given me my life back. My health is, is better. You know, I hope I've extended the longevity of my life because of it. ZepBound comes with side effects like Wigovi and Ozempic, including nausea, constipation, and abdominal pain. Injectable weight loss drugs are not always covered by insurance and can cost over $1,000 a month. Eli Lilly says ZepBound will be 20% cheaper than its competitors. 
Our thanks to Ariel Reshev. Still ahead, a gruesome discovery. Nearly 200 decomposing bodies improperly restored at a funeral home. What the funeral home is accused of giving families instead of their loved ones' ashes. But next, the arguments before the Supreme Court that could put more firearms into the hands of domestic abusers. Our Devin Dwyer takes a stark look at what's at stake for women in tonight's Prime Focus. We believe that a Second Amendment empowers a woman to fight back against a violent abuser and to hold her own. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. This week, the Supreme Court appeared likely to uphold a federal ban on guns for Americans subject to domestic violence restraining orders. Gun rights advocates had challenged the law, claiming it violated the Second Amendment. But will the justices decide that all restrictions on firearms for dangerous people, especially abusive intimate partners, can stand? In our prime focus tonight, our Devin Dwyer takes a closer look at the case and what's at stake. I have three in my head. Um, I have one in uh, my right side and one in my left side. Lachey Craychan still carries all five bullets from the day her ex-boyfriend shot her. She's given each of them a name. Fate, fight, forget, forgive, and my family. Why did you name them? Because I have to carry them the remaining days of my life. Hmm. And they were a part of me. It was October 1996. Lachey was a high school senior in Opelousas, Louisiana, working at McDonald's and mothering two young children when her relationship with the father of her daughter started to become violent. And did you know whether he had any guns at the time? I'd witnessed him pull a gun up to a guy's head before. Did you fear for your life? Yes, I feared for my life because he told me he would kill me. He said I couldn't be with anybody else but him. And he showed it by hitting me. Afraid and confused, Lachey went to the police, who told her there was little they could do. Two months later, he confronted Lachey in front of her family and his own mother. And at first I said, I love you. And you can have the kids whatever you want, but I can't be with you. And I walked away, and that's when he shot me behind my head and in each hip. And I fell right next to my daughter. And my great aunt. She was just like, oh my God, he killed himself and she was at the door. They didn't think you were gonna make it. Yeah, I was just bleeding so much, I could feel the blood. Like Lachey's daughter, Shayla, who was four months old at the time, has no memory of that day, but now knows she was the reason her mom fought to survive. I know how strong she is. I see how strong she is. She has to go through it with the pain, the trauma, the everything, you know? So it's been hard for me, but I feel like it cannot be any harder for me than 
it is for her. Do you think if he had been subjected to a domestic violence restraining order that maybe he wouldn't have been able to get that gun? Yes, I do. I do. Every year, judges nationwide issue thousands of domestic violence restraining orders to limit contact between an aggressor and a victim. And since a 1994 federal law, those orders have also been a basis to deny someone access to a gun through the background check system. Some states go far beyond this by ensuring compliance, not just that they're prohibited from purchasing a new one, but that they're actually giving up the firearms that are already in their possession. Congress enacted the ban on guns for people under restraining orders to help prevent cases like Lachey's. Over 12 million American adults are victims of domestic abuse every year, and researchers say when a gun is involved, it's five times more likely someone will die. The FBI says the law has blocked more than 77,000 attempted firearm purchases by people under domestic violence restraining orders. We know that it's not just intimate partners murdering their, their partners. We know that they're doing it with firearms and that these laws are preventing them from doing that. But now those laws hang in the balance before the U.S. Supreme Court, where gun rights advocates, backed by a lower court decision, say they must be struck down for violating the Second Amendment. This statute actually ends up disarming a bunch of law-abiding or, or otherwise good people um, that you might not expect uh, when you first look at it. Aiden Johnston is with Gun Owners of America. Judges often issue mutual restraining orders, which disarms both the victim and the abuser at the same time. And then also these are abused by divorce attorneys as a way to get a one-up or a tactical advantage in a divorce proceeding. The high court case involves Zaki Rahimi, a drug dealer in Texas who is now behind bars for assaulting his girlfriend and threatening her and another woman with a gun. Rahimi is challenging a charge of illegal gun possession in violation of a domestic violence restraining order, saying it's unconstitutional and should be dismissed. No one is arguing that he should be released from jail and it has no bearing on what the Supreme Court is taking up. They're ruling on that very narrow question of whether a civil protective order can take away your constitutional rights. In a landmark decision last year, the Supreme Court expanded an individual's right to carry a gun outside the home, saying it can only be limited by public safety laws that have historical ties to the nation's founding. In 1791, there weren't very many cases of people using firearms against, uh, you know, a spouse or a girlfriend. It's an absolutely modern problem. They should clarify how closely analogous these historical laws need to be. We believe that a Second Amendment empowers a woman to fight back against a violent abuser and to hold her own. Gun rights groups say women like Erin Hart, a single mother of two we met in 2020 as she bought her first handgun, can't depend on federal regulations to stay safe. My nightmare scenario would be being at home, you know, alone, middle of the night, and it's just myself, you know, and the boys and, um, and someone, you know, coming in to harm us. But gun safety advocates say the law prohibiting guns for people involved with domestic violence is rooted in common sense and working as intended. You suck in. There you go. <laughs> Shayla encouraged her mother to publicly share her story to help raise awareness. I would like to introduce Lachey. And for Lachey, who now volunteers with the Moms Demand Action Network, it's been another step toward healing. We can end gun violence and we can do it together. Lachey says the pain from her bullet wounds still requires regular surgeries 27 years later. But she's made peace with her late ex-boyfriend, even encouraging Shayla to love him. I made sure to forgive him for his actions because he gave me so much joy. And that's my kids. So see your brother, Both women remain hopeful the Supreme Court won't roll back a 30-year-old law aimed at protecting them. I'll never have my father. I wish he never had the gun. I wish there was something that prevented it. Right now, we can stop it so that nobody else, no other families, no other kids have to go through what we have went through. So many living with fears and fallout. Our thanks to Devin for that. If you or someone you know is experiencing domestic or intimate partner abuse, there is help. Please reach out to the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233.
And we still have much more to get to tonight on Prime. Coming up, a possible major loss for Adidas totaling $320 million. The once popular merchandise it may never sell. But next, Ohio is one of the latest states voting to legalize marijuana. We take a look at just how much the opinions on pot have changed by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I think in many ways that I do have kind of two lives. The one before I was hit. ABC's Bob Woodruff. And the one after. Seriously injured. Their convoy was hit by an IED. I always wanted to somehow finish this assignment. And so now's the time. I'm thinking about go back to Iraq. Really? I uh, wish you luck. Love you. I think we did this 20 years ago. Right. <laughs> This Friday night on ABC. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every Every episode, wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Reporting from LaGuardia Airport, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Voters in Ohio overwhelmingly agreed to legalize recreational marijuana in yesterday's election. We have a look at the Ohio vote and the growing acceptance of marijuana nationwide by the numbers. 85% of Ohio voters voted for legalization, making Ohio the 24th state to decriminalize marijuana. And while a record-breaking 34% of yesterday's voters self-identified as liberal in our Ohio exit polls, 30% of Republicans and 23% of conservatives also supported the marijuana measure. Nationally, 70% of adults now favor legalization, according to a new Gallup poll. Support among self-identified conservatives rose to 51% last year, making this one issue a majority of people from all ages, political parties, and ideologies agree on. One boon 
For states that legalize, the pot market is now worth $64 billion, nearly tripling over the last three years. In Ohio, a 10% sales tax is projected to generate about $300 million in revenue a year. Ohio lawmakers still need to ratify the law. It's expected to go into effect in 30 days. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. Artificial intelligence is set to have a major role in 2024 political ads, making it hard to know what's real and what's fake. How one social media site says it's planning to clear up any confusion. How two pandas were transported from the D.C. Zoo to deliver them to a new home on a different continent. And there were many contenders, but there can only be one who People Magazine just named this year's Sexiest Man Alive. It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shock. Mrs. Kennedy's leg was stained with her husband's blood. She said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. The common data was saying, Lyndon Johnson, now President of the United States. That was when the enormity struck me. I was walking on to a stage for a part I had never rehearsed. I ought to record this. Dr. King's been shot. Senator Kennedy had been shot. But Vietnam dominated the news. What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. Was it because I was alive? The greatest courage is to go about the day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Nearly 200 decomposing bodies are found at a funeral home. An earthquake shakes part of the Southwest. And why two animals are being taken away from the D.C. Zoo and sent to China. These stories and much more in tonight's Rundown.
Police in Colorado arresting the couple who owns the Return to Nature funeral home in Penrose. It's in connection with 190 bodies they found decaying and abandoned at the funeral home last month. John and Carrie Halford facing several charges, including abuse of a corpse and money laundering. Neighbors alerted police after reporting a foul smell coming from the area. Court documents claim some of the bodies were stacked on top of one another. Several families accusing the owners of giving them concrete mix instead of their loved one's ashes. Millions of Yeezy brand shoes produced by Adidas have gone unsold. Now the company might have to write off about $320 million worth of that product. Adidas cut ties with hip-hop artist Kanye West last year after he posted anti-Semitic comments online. When the partnership ended, Adidas sold hundreds of millions of dollars worth of Yeezy merchandise and sent part of those profits to advocacy groups. There are new rules for some ads on Facebook and Instagram. They must now tell users if they're using artificial intelligence. Parent company Meta saying advertisers hoping to post political, editorial, and social ads must disclose if they used AI in videos of people saying and doing things they never did in real life. If the company finds advertisers lied about that disclosure, Meta says they will reject the ad and possibly penalize that company. First of all, I thought it was like a breeze because I saw the windows shaking and I thought it was too much and it, just like for 10 seconds, I felt like the building shake. Residents in West Texas experienced a rare earthquake in the early morning hours. At around 3.30 a.m., a 5.3 magnitude quake rippled through the remote area and was felt as far as 200 miles away. There were no injuries or damages initially reported. People magazine announced this year's sexiest man alive. Actor Patrick Dempsey was unveiled last night on Jimmy Kimmel Live as the magazine's choice for this year's title. The 57-year-old is best known for his role as Dr. Derek Shepard on the long-running medical drama Grey's Anatomy, earning him back-to-back -back Globe nominations for portraying Mick Dreamy. The actor is also an avid race car driver participating in the 24-hour Le Mans, a prestigious endurance race held in France. He is slated to appear this Christmas in the Enzo Ferrari biographical film, Ferrari. Fans of the beloved giant pandas at the National Zoo are saying final goodbyes as the animals prepare to head back to China. The Chinese pandas, Mei Shang and Tian Tian, arrived at the National Zoo in 2000. They were only supposed to be on loan from China for 10 years, but the agreement was renewed three times. And in 2020, they had a baby boy. But efforts to renew the agreement again failed. Experts say it's a sign of worsening relations between the U.S. and China. The pandas will leave on a special FedEx flight called the Panda Express and will travel with 300 pounds of bamboo to munch on. About one year ago, billionaire Elon Musk happily marched through the front doors of the company then known as Twitter carrying a kitchen sink. His takeover of the social media platform came with the promise of fundamental changes and its transformation to X. But it's also led to a vicious internal battle for control that has been splashed across headlines. Author Ben Mesrick joins us now to discuss the turbulent acquisition in his book, Breaking Twitter, Elon Musk and the Most Controversial Corporate Takeover in History. Welcome to the show, Ben. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. So you had these massive firings, uh, uh, a bunch of adv advertisers who left. You don't have as many daily users on, on X anymore. How did we get here? Yeah, I mean, it's been a crazy spiral. Um, the, the thesis of my book is that Elon didn't just break Twitter, Twitter broke Elon mm. Musk. He came in with noble intentions, you know, from his point of view, he was trying to save the world from a, a, what he called a woke mind virus. Um, he felt like Twitter was being over moderated and he wanted to create a place for free speech walked through the doors with that kitchen sink and very quickly discovered that free speech is more complicated than building rocket ships, things spiraled out of control. Um, and very quickly, for the first time in his career, he faced uh, dislike, disdain. Uh, the whole world started to rally against him because he was doing crazy things at Twitter. It, do you think that he's he's bothered by the attacks and, and this downward spiral, or, or does he just No, he really off? is bothered. And one of the stories that I tell in the book, which really hadn't been out there in the news yet, is that he reached a point after he tweeted a poll, um, should I 
leave as CEO and bring in a new CEO, if you remember that poll. Yes. And he fully expected everyone to say, no, we love you, Elon. And the poll came back, you should leave. And he freaked out. And he actually apparently locked himself in a conference room for as much as a day. The Twitter people actually got so worried they were going to call the San Francisco police and do a wellness check oh. on him. And so he reached a very low point because for the first time in his life, half the world was not behind him. And this was new to him. It, you had unique access to Twitter employees, some yes. of Musk's confidants. What most surprised you that you learned? Um, you know, the thing that most surprised me um, were some of the uh, events that happened along the way that I didn't know about. For instance, he got so paranoid at a point that not only did he have bodyguards with him all the time, but he made it a rule that no more than two Twitter employees were allowed to gather at a time because he was afraid of a mutiny. Um, he sees the whole world as some sort of video game. Like he believes that he's in a simulation and that not only is he the main player, but we're all non-player characters. And I think that guides him as he walks through life. Um, he doesn't take others seriously because they're not real to him. The social platform is now valued at about half right. at what Musk bought it for. Do you think if he could do it all over again, he'd still purchase Twitter? I mean, I don't know that he'd admit this, but there's no way. He was reluctantly forced into it. He already tried to get out of it right. once. Uh, and then he came in and did scorched earth because he was angry. Um, and it's reached a point where their own valuation is less than half. And that's really incredible in a year to lose $20 billion on a company that was almost break even uh, when he took it over. I believe that if there was a way to get out of it with it not looking like a loss, he would. What interested you so much about Elon Musk that you wanted to write a book about this? Well, I came into this as a huge fan of Elon. And I'm actually truly a huge fan still of the SpaceX Elon, the, the guy, the Tesla Elon. The business acumen. Right, this is a guy who wants to bring us to Mars. I mean, how can you not love that? But um, I also knew that he was complex. And I always write about characters that are larger than life. Um, but as I dug into the story and talked to people who were around him, it just seemed so crazy. And it was... Uh, a story that I think has been missed, there's the big biography by Walter Isaacson that's out there about Elon, which is a great encyclopedic story of his life. But what it misses is how much an effect this misadventure at Twitter has been and how it's actually spiraled Elon out of control. What do you think is the future for, for X, formerly known as Twitter? I mean, I feel like it's a disaster happening in front of our eyes. It's losing engagement. It's losing money. Um, he's now talking about an everything app, which will be a payment structure, a dating app he's talked about. I think that Twitter itself, which is supposed to be this noble global you know, town hall, is slowly being relegated to being an angry little outrage-driven chat site, um, which is very sad to those of us who used to love Twitter. Ben, we thank you so much. Really fascinating conversation and peeling back the, the <laughs> curtain on, on Elon Musk. Want to let our viewers know, breaking Twitter, Elon Musk and the most controversial corporate takeover in history is now available wherever books are sold. Actress Megan Fox became a Hollywood star at 21 after landing the female lead in Transformers. She's been in dozens of movies since, but says behind the scenes, her life was often grim. Fox tells ABC's Kana Whitworth how she came through. I wrote a lot of things that didn't make it in the book because I was like, this is maybe for God's eyes only. Where did you find the strength to, to not only write about it, to put it on paper and put it out there for the world to see? I did really believe that if I didn't get this out of me, it was gonna cause cancer or some kind of chronic illness because it was just living inside of me, eating me alive. This is a side of Megan Fox few have seen. Known for her scene-stealing roles in the blockbuster Transformers franchise. It squirts the fuel in so you can go faster. Oh. I like to go faster. And the cult classic Jennifer's Body. And in music videos, like Machine Gun Kelly's Bloody Valentine. The Hollywood star now stepping into a new role as an author. You said your freedom lives in these pages. Yeah. Do you feel liberated now that it's out there? In many ways, yes. There's a lot of rather dark subject matter written about in the book. And so there's the, the freedom of having finally put it somewhere. This new book of poetry, a part diary, part metaphorical work of art, detailing her tumultuous and sometimes volatile love life. True love, twin flame, trusted friend, naive girl, so many secrets hiding behind your scorched earth temper.
I would say, at different periods throughout my life. I was dealing with some really heavy experiences with different people. That involved physical, emotional, and mental yeah. violence, essentially. Yes. There is one poem, and the entire poem is, I hate men seven times. Yeah. I just want to say the book is written specifically from my victim mentality, my victim self, who that's not a holistic representation of who I am and what I believe, but it's a poetry book. I'm not trying to encourage anybody to hate men, but is this a book about how part of me hates men? For sure. It seemed so dark and so real mm -hmm. when you talk about someone spitting on your face mm -hmm. and smudging it and holding you down mm -hmm. and hitting you and then falling asleep on top of you so that yeah. you couldn't call police. Mm -hmm. Intentionally, yeah. That's all real. Those are all real experiences, yeah. Um, that's probably the dark, most graphic poem that I wrote. By sharing her harrowing past, Fox says she's now reclaiming her voice. As I was reading, if some of it was also a metaphor for how you were treated in Hollywood. Some of it is definitely a metaphor. Um, none of it is what I would call fictional. Those are all real life experiences that I had speaking about my career in Hollywood and about how I've had to go up against some of the most powerful men in the world and um, the mirror that I've had to be for them and the way they've projected onto me. And so that definitely is not really a metaphor, that, but that is a, a, a poem addressing that specifically, yeah. Despite her blockbuster hits with some of entertainment's biggest names, she says it was her role in Jennifer's body. I am a god. Okay. That proved to be a poignant experience for her. I have so many girls in particular coming up to me and saying, like, you helped me come out to my parents. You helped me realize I was gay or bisexual or you helped me, like, understand my sexual identity. I'm so grateful that I was a part of something that has affected people in that way. That that's the only thing that's, for me, at least rewarding about being a celebrity. The rest of it is kind of terrible. Terrible, and she says, sometimes painful. But one thing she's not revealing in her book it's Names of the Accused. I'm, this is not an expose that I wrote or a memoir. I'm not trying to draw attention to who those people were or were not. But throughout my life, I have been in at least one physically abusive relationship and several psychologically very abusive relationships. When you decided that you wanted to do this, who in your personal life was your biggest supporter. The person who actually told me I should write a poetry book is Colson. Colson Baker, also known as Machine Gun Kelly. Now, the artist and Fox romantically linked up nearly three years ago. She writes about their love story in the book and also the intimate moment of losing a pregnancy. We were not able to see a pregnancy through at one point in our relationship and there was a tremendous amount of like grief and an emotional fallout that we went through together. I obviously went through a space where everybody blames themselves, like he blames himself, I blame myself, and why did this happen? And if she could have said goodbye to us, if she could have told us why she was leaving, do you think she would have? Fox now transforming the trauma she says she faced onto pen and paper. Her message to women? You don't have to stay silent. It gives like an elegant place for your pain to live, to put it into art, makes it useful to other people, and so you don't just suffer with it on your own. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. For the next hour, another promising development in treating obesity, the drug just approved by the FDA that could be more effective than other brands, and how the largest Palestinian community outside of the Middle East is raising calls for a ceasefire. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed, getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime.
We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I think in many ways that I do have kind of two lives. The one before I was hit. ABC's Bob Woodruff. And the one after. Seriously injured. Their convoy was hit by an IED. I always wanted to somehow finish this assignment. And so now's the time. I'm thinking about go back to Iraq. Really? I uh, wish you luck. Love you. I think we did this 20 years ago. Right. <laughs> This Friday night on ABC. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including a massive fire at a chemical plant near Houston that's prompting evacuation, shelter in place orders, and concerns about contamination and illness. We're in Texas for more on the developing story. Plus, former President Trump's daughter Ivanka taking the stand in a $250 million civil trial focused on her father and the family business. And she's breaking the world record for the biggest wave ever paddled into by a woman. We take you to Australia, where history was broken when we go around the world. But we begin with former President Trump's daughter, Ivanka, taking the stand in that $250 million civil trial focused on her father and the family business. Ivanka's testimony was the last for the prosecution and very different than that of her father and brothers. She had fought for weeks to try and not give testimony and ultimately was forced to. Later this afternoon, New York Attorney General Letitia James rested her case against Donald Trump and his adult sons. Our senior investigative reporter, Aaron Katursky, leads us off from New York. She's not a defendant in this case, and she didn't want to be here. But today, Ivanka Trump forced to testify in the civil fraud trial threatening the Trump family business. How you feeling, Ivanka? On the witness stand, she testified she played no role in her father's statements of financial condition that the judge has determined were riddled with fraud. Those weren't things I was privy to, she said, echoing her deposition. I, I don't specifically know what was prepared on his behalf for him as a person separate and distinct from the organization. She acknowledged working to secure loans guaranteed by her father's wealth for Trump properties like the Doral Golf Club in Miami, but she says she couldn't remember the details, at one point saying, I believe it was the ninth month of pregnancy of my oldest daughter. 
Attorney General Letitia James unmoved. This case is about fraudulent statements of financial condition that she benefited from. She was enriched, and clearly you cannot distance yourself from that fact. Our thanks to Aaron Katursky. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill today, House Republicans ramped up their impeachment inquiry into President Biden, issuing new subpoenas to members of President Biden's family. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas joins us now. And Pierre, who are these subpoenas targeting, and, and how's the White House and Biden family responding tonight? Well, Lindsay, the House Oversight Committee has issued subpoenas for testimony of members of President Biden's family, including his brother James and his son Hunter. The committee escalating its efforts to see if President Biden financially benefited from family business deals, which House Republicans are claiming amounted to influence peddling. But so far, Chairman James Comer's committee has produced no evidence of crimes by the president. And today, the White House dismissed the impeachment inquiry as a baseless smear campaign that has turned up zero evidence. Hunter Biden's attorney responded to the subpoena, saying his client would eagerly testify in public at the right time, even as he called the committee's efforts a political stunt, Lindsay. All right, Pierre Thomas for us from Washington. Thanks so much, Pierre. We turn now to the latest developments in the Middle East with news of a U.S. airstrike on a weapons storage facility in Syria. The Pentagon says the retaliatory strikes come after Iranian-backed forces have been targeting American troops in both Iraq and Syria for weeks since the conflict in Israel began. We have team coverage on the latest developments tonight, including ABC's Matt Rivers in Israel. But we go first to our chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raddatz, in Washington. Tonight, retaliation. U.S. warplanes striking a weapons facility in Syria after Iranian-backed forces targeted American troops in Iraq and Syria with a barrage of drone and rocket attacks over the weekend, making at least 40 such attacks on Americans since mid-October. Most of those intercepted and no serious injuries reported. This is the second time the U.S. has launched these retaliatory airstrikes in response to attacks on American troops by Iran-backed militants. On October 26th, launching missiles into two weapons storage facilities in Syria. Just hours before these latest retaliatory attacks, one of the most serious provocations by Iranian-backed militants since the Israel-Hamas conflict began. A U.S. defense official confirming that Houthi forces in Yemen shot down a U.S. Reaper drone over waters off Yemen's coast. The MQ-9 Reaper is one of the most sophisticated and expensive armed drones in the U.S. arsenal. Just weeks ago, the USS Kearney brought down four Houthi cruise missiles and more than a dozen drones aimed towards Israel from the Red Sea. Our thanks to Martha Radis. Next tonight, the war between Israel and Hamas is now in its second month. There are multiple reports that tense negotiations are now underway for the release of up to 15 hostages, including Americans. ABC's Matt Rivers is in Israel. Tonight, urgent negotiations underway for the potential release of dozens of hostages held by Hamas in Gaza. Sources telling ABC News Israel is considering a proposal brought by Egypt and Qatar for a humanitarian pause in exchange for the release with the U.S. in close coordination. But so far, no final deal has been reached. Just days ago, David Pressing, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on the hostages, which includes Americans. Netanyahu saying no ceasefire unless the hostages are released. If Hamas agrees to release the hostages, then there would be a pause. Well, there'd be a ceasefire for that purpose. Uh, and we're waiting for that to happen. It hasn't happened so far. Do you know where the hostages are? Do you know where the Americans are? We have some uh, intelligence. I'm not sure it's wise to uh, share it here with Hamas. The Israeli military saying ground forces are pushing deeper into Gaza City, destroying 130 tunnel shafts, claiming Hamas has lost control of northern Gaza. The UN saying 40,000 Palestinians fled south over the past three days through a humanitarian corridor set up by the IDF, some in this crowd holding white flags. <laughs> And the civilian death toll keeps rising. Ten-year-old Hanin saying she's scared of the bombings and just wants to go back home and back to school. Can understand why. Our thanks to Matt Rivers for that. Back here in the U.S., a dangerous explosion and fire at a chemical plant near Houston, Texas, prompted evacuations across a five-mile radius today. ABC's John Quinones is on the scene in Shepherd, Texas. 
Tonight, that massive inferno of flames and fumes northeast of Houston. What a horrific sight to be seeing from a thousand feet above the ground. The calls coming in just after eight this morning from Sound Resource Solutions, a chemical plant in Shepherd, Texas. Our Office of Emergency Management has issued that shelter in place for a five mile radius around the plant. At first I thought they were emptying the garbage bin, but then after you heard the third and fourth and fifth explosion that were one after another. Schools have been advised to shelter in place, turn off all HVACs. One school close to the plant forced to evacuate 31 children. We had to evacuate them through a pasture. Uh, a man owns a large piece of property over there, and they were gracious enough to open the gates and allow uh, these vehicles to uh, traverse his land. We are seeing some of these uh, mini explosions happening yet again. Look at this right here. Tammy zooming into it. Boy, this is very concerning. The plant houses multiple kinds of toxic and highly flammable materials. We do oil fill chemicals, we do paint and coatings chemicals, hazardous materials, yes, but it's the type of material you probably have under your kitchen sink. It's not to be taken lightly. Our thanks to John for that. Now to some developing news out of Hollywood tonight where we're hearing the actor strike that has raged on for 118 days may finally be coming to an end with the Actors Union representing more than 160,000 actors reaching a tentative agreement with major film and TV studios. The contract still needs to be ratified by the union, but according to our reporting, that new contract would boost minimum pay for members, increase residuals for streaming shows, and establish new rules for AI. In Miami tonight, five Republican candidates for president are about to square off on the debate stage. This comes after last night's elections with big wins for Democrats, especially on abortion. And of course, the elephant in the room once again, the front runner, former President Trump, will not be there. ABC's senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott reports from Miami. Tonight, Democrats pointing to victories in Virginia, Kentucky and Ohio as proof abortion is increasingly the issue that decides elections. The voters said, look, the government should not be telling a woman what to do with her body. President Biden declaring democracy won and MAGA lost. And in an attempt to dismiss his own sliding poll numbers, he added, voters vote, polls don't. In Ohio, voters overwhelmingly choosing to protect abortion rights in the state constitution. In Virginia, voters rejected the Republican governor's effort to flip the state legislature from Democratic control. He promised to sign a 15-week abortion ban with exceptions, casting it as a compromise. Voters rejected that. Uh, I'm a little disappointed, to be clear. And in the South, a rare red state Democratic governor winning re-election, fending off his opponent's effort to tie him to President Biden. It was a victory that sends a loud, clear message. A message that candidates should run for something and not against someone. <laughs> that a candidate should show vision and not sow division. Our thanks to Rachel Scott for that. A chilling case in Detroit where police have arrested a suspect wanted for killing a synagogue leader. Samantha Wool was found dead outside of her townhouse last month. Investigators believe she was stabbed inside her home and stumbled outside where she collapsed. Authorities say the suspect acted alone. There are no words of a possible motive yet, and the murder is not being investigated as a hate crime. There was also no sign of forced entry into her home. Eight people have been killed in a horrific crash on the highway in Batesville, Texas, about 50 miles from the U.S.-Mexico border. A driver allegedly smuggled migrants into the U.S., crashing head-on into an SUV on Highway 57. The driver allegedly tried to outrun police. The highway closed for several hours following the collision. We turn now to the urgent manhunt 40 miles outside of New York City in Middlesex County, New Jersey, after a suspect wanted in the January 6th attack evaded authorities. Police say Gregory Yetman is wanted for the assault of a federal officer. ABC Stephanie Ramos is on the scene. An all-out manhunt tonight in this small central New Jersey town just 40 miles southwest of New York City after this man, wanted in connection to the attack at the Capitol on January 6, evaded arrest. Gregory Yetman fleeing on foot into the wooded area near his home. Police searching from the sky and on the ground. According to USA Today, Yetman is suspect number 278 AFO, wanted for assault of a federal officer, pictured at the Capitol in these photos on the FBI's website. In an interview earlier this year, Yetman indicated he was at the Capitol that day, but said he did nothing wrong. 
The FBI leading the multi-agency manhunt in the town of Helmeta. Officers in tactical gear, looking in vehicles, teams moving through backyards, armed with long guns and canines. There were officers running through everybody's yards. Um, asking questions. Even though the sun has gone down, we can still see Joint Terrorism Task Force agents going door to door looking for Yetman. According to police, Yetman is in his 40s, last seen wearing a red jacket and baseball cap. He served in the New Jersey National Guard for 12 years and was honorably discharged in March of 2022. They are determined to attain this gentleman today. That is their effort. Our thanks to Stephanie Ramos for that. The county clerk in the trial of Alex Murdoch is speaking out for the first time after being accused of jury tampering. Becky Hill is denying any wrongdoing in the trial that led to Murdoch's conviction for killing his wife and son. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has those details. There, there was the no woman at the center of Alec Murdoch's push for a new trial, breaking her silence and declaring her innocence. Murdoch's legal team accusing Becky Hill, the court clerk, of tampering with the jury. Hill denying the allegations against her, saying in a new sworn affidavit, she, quote, did not tell the jury not to be fooled by evidence presented by Mr. Murdoch's attorneys. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Hill seen here in court reading the guilty verdict. The judge handing Murdoch a double life sentence for the murders of his wife and son. But Murdoch's attorney saying Hill pressured the jurors to reach a quick verdict and that she invented a story about a Facebook post to remove a juror she believed might not vote guilty, all to secure a book deal for herself and media appearances that would not happen in the event of a mistrial. The clerk of court had improper private communications with the jurors. The subject matter of those communications was the credibility of the defense. Hill publishing this book after the trial and seen discussing the verdict in a recent Netflix special, Murdoch Murders, a Southern Scandal. I had a feeling from our time together with the jury out at Moselle that it was not gonna take our jury long to make the decision in this case. It's just called that women's intuition. But in her affidavit, Hill saying she never voiced that thought to the jurors, never told them this shouldn't take us long. Prosecutors saying none of the jurors who willingly interviewed with state investigators reported feeling any pressure or influence to reach their verdict, and that only one former juror who was dismissed from the trial and did not deliberate on the verdict made direct statements supporting Murdoch's allegations. Hill acted improperly. Hill's lawyer telling ABC News in a statement, we have fully respected the investigatory process, which was tough given the horrible things said about Mrs. Hill on Alec Murdoch's behalf. However, you can put to bed any allegation that Mrs. Hill tampered. Our thanks to Eva Pilgrim for that. New promise for treating obesity tonight. The FDA has approved a drug from Eli Lilly explicitly for use in treating obesity. Zepbound has the same active ingredient as diabetes drug Monjaro, and research suggests it could be even more effective for weight loss than Ozempic and Wegovi. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, a powerful new weapon in the fight against obesity. The FDA approving Zepbound with the same ingredient in the diabetes drug Munjaro, but for weight loss. We're changing the way medicine is practiced in the United States by treating the obesity with naturally occurring gut hormone therapy that is going to reverse the risk of developing heart disease and diabetes. Zepbound from Eli Lilly works like the injectable weight loss drugs Ozempic and Wegovi, mimicking a hormone that makes the body feel full. But Zepbound targets a second hormone and research suggests it may lead to more dramatic weight loss. Christy Kaiser says she lost 122 pounds after 15 months on the drug. She says she's no longer pre-diabetic and no longer needs blood pressure medicine. For me personally, it has given me my life back. My health is, is better. You know, I hope I've extended the longevity of my life because of it. Zepbound comes with side effects like Wegovy and Ozempic, including nausea, constipation and abdominal pain. Injectable weight loss drugs are not always covered by insurance and can cost over $1,000 a month. Eli Lilly says Zebbound will be 20% cheaper than its competitors. A lot of interest in these drugs. Ariel Reshev joins us now. Ariel, when can people expect this drug to be available? Well, Lindsay, Eli Lilly says that Zebbound should be available just after Thanksgiving. Ariel Reshev for us. Thanks so much, Ariel.
Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, a mother says artificial intelligence was used to create explicit photos of her high schooler, what she's now pushing other parents to do. But next, the desperate rescue efforts after flooding kills dozens of people and forces hundreds of thousands to flee their homes. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Buckingham Palace, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Chile's Palestinian community, the largest outside the Middle East, has been galvanized since the start of the war, holding rallies outside the presidential palace, organizing charity concerts, clamoring for a ceasefire and pushing for boycotts. The Palestinian community's roots are deep in Chile, with immigration starting in the late 19th century when Christians fled the faltering Ottoman Empire. The worst flooding to hit Somalia in decades has killed 29 people and forced more than 300,000 to flee their homes. Authorities have scrambled to rescue thousands of stranded people from the floodwater, which comes on the heels of the region's worst drought in 40 years. Australian Laura Enever has surfed her way into the record books after stroking into a giant four-story wave in Hawaii earlier this year. The World Surf League and Guinness World Records announced it today. Enever, who's 31, was surfing at an outer reef on Oahu's North Shore in January when she caught a huge blue wall, measured at 43.6 feet, breaking the world record for the biggest wave ever paddled into by a woman. Congratulations to her. A high school student and her mother are opening up after a student allegedly used artificial intelligence to create fake nude images of her and other girls which circulated around their New Jersey school. The school is now encouraging parents to talk with their children about what they're posting, saving and sharing on social media. Our Eva Pilgrim has the story. When 14-year-old Francesca Mani got called last month into the principal's office, she wasn't in trouble. Instead, she was told some disturbing news. She was one of the victims of fake AI-generated nude photos created by a male classmate. I realized she shouldn't be sad, but I should be mad. So I came home and I told my mom and I told her that we have to do something about this because it isn't fair to the girls and it's just not right. My first initial feeling obviously was a shock. Um, to hear such a thing from, from your daughter. She filed a police report and has been in touch with the school. The photographs were distributed through Snapchat. He also mentioned that I should not worry because Snapchat only lasts for three to five seconds, which we all know. You can save it, you can screenshot it, you can 
Somebody else can take a picture of your um, of, of that pictures. Westfield High's principal sent a letter to parents saying students brought to our attention that some of our students had used artificial intelligence to create pornographic images from original photos. At this time, we believe that any created images have been deleted and are not being circulated. This is a very serious incident. We are continuing to investigate. According to Francesca and her mother, so far only one male schoolmate served a short suspension, and they say he's already back in school. I just feel like very uncomfortable and very scared, like a lot of other girls agree with me. We just don't think it's right that he's walking the hallways. The Monies say they have not seen the fake images and don't know of other alleged victims who have seen them. ABC News has not been able to confirm whether these images exist. Experts say New Jersey has strict laws against the sexually explicit depiction of minors, including fake images. The fact that the perpetrators are minors might mean that there's leniency here or certain types of attempts to keep them out of the, you know, the incarceration system, but it wouldn't mean that they could not be punished at all. This is a moment where we should be teaching our girls and Westfield High School that they are worth it to fight for and what has happened, it's not okay. And we should be teaching our boys that there will be consequences. Our thanks to Eva Pilgrim for that. And still to come, there's something special about the loyalty Philadelphia Eagles fans have for their team. How two diehard birds lovers caught the eye of the team. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, there is no loyalty quite like the loyalty of Philadelphia Eagle fans to their teams. And there are two old friends whose fandom is so special, it's actually made them go viral, prompting the football team to even take notice. Our Danny New has this story. Before the Philadelphia Eagles game a few weeks ago, nobody seemed to want this mysterious envelope. What is that? Until longtime pals Terrence and Marie grabbed it and found out the team's social media staff was actually trying to give away two free sideline passes. Oh my God! Uh, God bless you. Oh my gosh, of course. Could you ever imagine that you would be on the sideline of an Eagles game one day? No. Cynthia, you'll never believe where I am. Believe it, Cynthia. And after this video picked up over a million likes on Instagram. Welcome, welcome. The team invited Terrence Marie and her daughter, Cynthia, to come visit the team facilities. I thought, you know, you, you'd have to have, uh, you'd have to have a uh, presidential clearance to get in there. I saw your video, you're amazing. <laughs> well, it helps when everyone on the team recognizes you. <laughs> team captain Brandon Graham brought Terrence and Marie custom signed jerseys from the players. And they got to try on the team's Super Bowl rings from 2018. And Marie just got so many hugs. Marie, I bet you she still feels the hugs from those guys. They say don't meet your heroes, but for these two friends of 30 years. Keep doing what you're doing, baby. It's okay to at least give them a big old hug. I know they love their fans and we love them. Yes. Nothing like a hug from Marie.
Fly, Eagles, fly. That's our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. To crush a family.